Thanks for downloading the In Our Time podcast. For more details about In Our Time and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. I hope you enjoy the programme. Hello. Quote, I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, to front only the essential facts of life, and not, when I came to die, discover that I had not lived. I wanted to live deep and suck out all the marrow of life. Thus wrote the American writer and philosopher Henry David Thoreau in his seminal work Walden, published in 1854. A fierce opponent of slavery, a champion of the simple life, a lover of nature and an enemy of the modern, Thoreau has become emblematic of one version of American values. His work has been an inspiration to politicians and writers alike, from Martin Luther King to Gandhi, Yeats and Tolstoy. Yet in many ways, Thoreau remains a mystery, a man of contradictions who advocated self-sufficiency, but was happy now and then to let others, including his mother, to do his washing and cook his meals. With me to discuss Thoreau and an American idol are Kathleen Burke, Professor of Modern and Contemporary History at University College London, Stephen Fender, Honorary Professor in English, also at University College London, and Tim Morris, Lecturer in American Literature at the University of Dundee. Kathleen Burke, Thoreau's birthplace in Concord, Massachusetts, played a major role in his life and work. What kind of town was it, and how are his early years spent there? Well, Concord was, in a sense, one of the sacred places of America. Uh, In 1775, it had seen the first shots with its neighboring village of Lexington in the American Revolution. And indeed, uh, Emerson, uh, whom one might call, we'll talk about later, uh, Thoreau's mentor, uh, wrote in the Concord hymn, this was where the embattled farmer stood and fired the shot heard round the world. Now, in 1775, the, the town was a declining town. It always uh, it was the same difficulty, one might say, when Thoreau was born. The land was bad, hard scrabbling. Um, it would only support, a farm would support one family, so youth left, boys had to go elsewhere to, to find a place to live. Um, after the revolution for about 20 years, you saw a real surge of, of prosperity, and that's when uh, roads were straightened and, and uh, there was more building. But when Thoreau was born, it was again in the grip of of uh, depression, one might say. And by the time he is born, it's iconic, uh, again, because of the sacred places, but it was also because it was so close to Boston and Cambridge. Um, it was an intellectual area as well, because you could you could rapidly get to some place where you, you could find ideas and so forth. And it was well on its way to its present status, I think, as a an intellectual bedroom community for Boston and Cambridge. His father started off a pencil business, making superior lead pencils, and Thoreau worked in that uh, factory for a while, didn't he? That's right. We think of Thoreau as as a man sort of wandering around the grass in the woods, but he was also very inventive, and indeed uh, he made the pencil a better instrument, you know, improved the graphite center and so forth. And, uh, I mean, his father had done other things. He'd been a shopkeeper and he'd been a teacher and so forth. But uh, he found some success in this pencil factory. And Thoreau was connected with it. People forget, I think, that he had an entrepreneurial uh, edge to him as well as uh, um, the intellectual edge. And we're talking about a good education, educated well locally and then off to Harvard. That's right. Um, he he was early in. The family put together the money to, to support this. He went uh, early to uh, Boston uh, Latin school where you learned Latin and Greek and languages and so forth and then went to Harvard at 16 which was not such a um, an unusual thing then and it, as, it, as it is now spent four years at Harvard reading, the ministry. Uh, uh, reading for the ministry but that also meant that you had Latin and Greek and so forth, it wasn't just theology He had an inordinate affection for Concord, he he left it now and then, obviously, to go to Harvard and then occasionally on little trips. But basically, that is what that was the centre of his world in 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 in, a, in almost a strange sense, given his uh, given his, his life possibilities. What do you make of that? Well, it is interesting. He uh, commiserated with with those who lived in London and Paris and Rome because they weren't able to live in Concord. He felt all the world could be found in Concord because what was important, of course, not only was context, was nature. And uh, um, everything you needed to learn, everything you needed to find out could be found in Concord. I mean, it was, it was also the fact that he was, it, it linked him with the whole history of, uh, of the United States, of America, of course. Again, you could see that, the microcosm of all the changes. 
He, the transcend, a group called the Transcendentalists could be said to have been based or centred, at least in Concord, and in the 1830s he joined that movement. Could you tell us what that stood for? Well, there's one might, well, it was a combination of, of uh, religion and philosophy, one might say. It had, I, I think, perhaps three strands. Partly it came out of the European Romantic movement, which put uh, priority on emotion over reason, uh, um, emphasized nature, usually with a capital N. Goethe, Coleridge, Wordsworth. That's right. Yes, he said later, well, anyhow, we won't talk about Wordsworth at this point. But, um, um, so you had the ideas of emotion and of man against authority and, and, and nature, as I say. Secondly, there was the whole Unitarian basis, the point of Unitarianism, which uh, Emerson and the other transcendentalists largely were Unitarians, was, first of all, free will instead of predestination, that the Bible is written by men. It doesn't come down you know, by the finger of God, uh, in fact. And also that Christ is, is, is a good man, but not divinity. So this goes entirely against the whole Puritan tradition, which is, of course, uh, New England is the, the origins and, and center. And thirdly, the idea of the Quaker inner light, that you, what's important is you follow your inner feelings of morality. You don't do what men say. And we can see all of this, I think, in Thoreau and due course. Tim Morris, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, who was a writer and philosopher and uh, leading light of the transcendentalists they met at his house in Concord, was highly... He was a sort of mentor figure for Thoreau, wasn't he? Could you tell him yeah. in what, what... Could you tell us, sorry, in what way Thoreau took up his ideas? Uh, well, even before he met at uh, Emerson's house, we might say that um, Thoreau had uh, attended... Uh, Emerson's famous uh, American scholar address at Harvard. That's the commencement ceremony of 1837. Uh, and uh, this was uh, an address which was really uh, energizing uh, Thoreau's class, indeed Thoreau's generation. Um, after that, uh, the two became uh, very close. And the ideas, uh, I think, which were probably most important to Thoreau uh, were the uh, ideas of nature which Emerson had uh, expressed in his uh, major book Nature which is published 1836 now in this book Emerson outlines um, really a, a program of nature which is based on individual self-reliance uh, in the face of nature uh, but also that uh, nature in a way is the manifestation uh, and uh, design uh, of a divine plan that is nature is a text which is readable out if you like uh, as the uh, let nature be your teacher. Let nature be your teacher, yes. That and Emerson had met Wordsworth, hadn't he? He had met Wordsworth previous to that. 1832. In 1832, 1833. So Emerson had come back, was uh, a very authoritative and superior figure in Concord at that time, had brought these ideas uh, with him. Uh, and so uh, Thoreau, I think, probably takes, um, uh, most of all, uh, this uh, transcendental philosophical idea of nature, uh, which, of course, then in Walden later, which we'll turn to, uh, he starts to live uh, and embody. So you, do we see him as a pupil of Emerson's in the, in the sense that Emerson gave him his central ideas? Uh, yes, I think so. Um, remember, though, that Thoreau had also studied uh, natural sciences uh, at Harvard, uh, zoology, botany, and so uh, was not merely uh, coming into this entirely cold. I think what Emerson gave Thoreau was... Uh, a philosophic design, um, an idealism, an insistence on subjectivity uh, and the possibility of an individual intuitive knowledge uh, of the divine through nature and through the study of nature. Can we develop that, please, uh, Tim, this intuitive notion? Uh, Emerson yes. famously at the time gave a lecture which Cat has alluded to saying Jesus was a man and not a god. That's right previous people who did that, the Cathars were subject to a crusade yeah, yeah. And, and slaughtered and blinded and put to the stake. He said that. Emerson he, simply wasn't invited he, back he, to he, he uh, Harvard for 30 years. Or whatever it was. Well, bad enough punishment perhaps, but yeah, <laughs> not yes. quite in the same league. Um, so so let's, let's talk about that because it's fascinating. Um, because we're talking about religious men, Unitarians, they were against the Trinity, but then they went further. So if you, um, um, Anyway, can you just explore that further? Yes. Um, what Emerson is particularly concerned with is, uh, and subsequently Thoreau, is the removal, if you like, of any mediation uh, between consciousness and knowledge of the divine. Uh, now, these mediations may come in many forms. It could be uh, dogma, uh, certain forms of pre-established ideologies, even received ideas at a lower level. 
um, and that the immediate intuitive uh, knowledge uh, of the divine can be read through nature as a text. Now, this takes, of course, um, uh, I feel like a, an intensely powerful creative imagination in order to be able to do so. Uh, and part of the uh, the kind of textual, the written program of both of them uh, in their writings uh, is to insist very often on the uh, inability of many of their townsmen, uh, even many of their fellow Americans, to be able to do so. Um, both Emerson and Thoreau are often uh, using ideas of the division of labor, for, in particular, uh, the, the social is a divided state uh, and that needs to be reintegrated back into an individual consciousness in order for this intuition to be, uh, as, uh, as I've said, in, in touch with uh, divine spirit, the oversoul, as uh, Emerson often called it. This idea of the world wisdom. Yes, right. indeed. Stephen Fender, um, in 1845, Thoreau made the great move. He moved out of the family house in Main Street. He would be three, he'd be 28 about that time, wouldn't he? In Main Street, Concord, and build himself a hut on a patch of ground about a mile, mile and a half outside the little town at a place called Walden. Can you give us an idea of why he did that and what Walden was like when he got there? Yes. Um, he went there in the first instance, I think, to... Uh, for a bit of solitude, not at first, I think, to commune with nature, but at first to clear his mind and clear his decks, and the decks, as it were, to write about his brother, who had recently died, Brother John, who had recently died of lockjaw, or tetanus, as it's technically known as, I think. And they had made, he was very close, very, very close to his brother. Um, they started a school together. They'd made a trip up the Concord and Merrimack Rivers in a kind of camping dinghy. And Thoreau's first book, in fact, was was about that trip called a, a, um, the Concord and Merrimack River, a, a voyage up it or down it or something. And he wanted to go there and write that book. That was the first thing he wanted to do. But bit by bit, as he, as he stayed there, as he as he began to make notes and began to notice the the uh, the attraction really of um, the everyday events in nature, began to note them down in his journal, and this became, this gradually grew into, through a series of steps, into Walden itself. Now, this land was owned by Emerson. Yes. He, Walden was a pond. What do you mean, what do Americans mean in this uh, instance by that's a, a very, pond? That's a good question, one which is not asked often enough. A pond in New England usage is a body of water not fed by a river. It's one fed by the groundwater table. Right. And, in fact, Walden is, um, is a kettle hole shaped by a, a retreating glacier. So it's a, it's a nearly oblong body of water, not terribly big, but, but big enough for, to be called a lake in some other, you know, in, in this country perhaps. Um, it's, as you said, it's about a mile and a half south of Concord Village. Um, as you stand on the North Shore, which is where his hut was, and where the reproduction today of it still is, um, to the to your right, which is the western shore, runs the railroad. Very important, of course, in this in this whole story. And to the right runs presently a uh, Route 126, State Route 126, which which goes down Bristol's Bristol's Hill. Uh, past Emerson's house. So he could get to Emerson's house down the old Concord Road on the left, and he could get to his sister and mother's um, down by walking the tracks. And they took you right down to the station, and, and their house was only about two blocks from the station. This hut, yeah, he built it, did he? He did. He actually did, because there's one or two things he said he did, he didn't. So he did He did build the hut. But he, What's he, the hut like? You said, yeah, I haven't seen there's it. There's a reproduction, when you, and in the summer there's a and in it's a state park, and there's a reproduction. And in the summer, there's a an intern who dresses up, or maybe I should say dresses yeah, but down. What's the hut so like? I'm not worried about uh, the intern. Uh, okay. <laughs> the hut is a very. Well, it's about the size of. Um, Don't say this studio. No, I won't say this studio because nobody can see it. But uh, you know, let's say um, fifteen by ten feet, or maybe twenty by. Has it got windows? It has one big. It has one, one big one do, window and one door and one room. Yes, as well. And, and a stone porch because he was very pleased with the stone. Yes, porch. That's, that's right. right. Yes, and stone. That's right. And a stone fireplace. Right. Um, and so that's where I live. And okay. he was. It was. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. And he was there about two years. Now, how? Um, how? Um, can we before we go into how he lived there? Can we? Can you just define as clearly as you can? Uh, what his reasons were for going for a sort of solitude. I mean, goodness knows, Concord was quiet enough. 
I, I think probably, um, really, as I say, initially to write to write up the um, the memoir to his brother. So it's almost like at the bottom of a garden, a hut at the bottom of it a garden. Really. It is really at that first stage. In effect, he was camping out. You know, you know if you if you if you reckon that he got most of a lot of his meals and his washing and so on was done by his mother and sister and so on. So he wasn't really living non-stop in Walden. But he's living, we'll come back to that in a second. Kathy, you want to get in? Kathy, back. I just had a question, actually. Uh, that area around Walden, I understand, was where outcasts went. Yes. And I'm just, I was just wondering whether, in fact, the fact that that's an outcast area also had any influence on in why he chose there. Or is it just that Emerson was willing to have him take some well, of the land? I, I think what, what we, the modern uh, Americans especially, forget is that Walden was less wooded and less country-like and in Thoreau's time than any time before or after. It, it had been largely denuded by charcoal-making industry, um, and the tall pines had been cut down to make railway ties or sleepers. And it was in, in Emerson's um, purpose in sending Thoreau there or granting him squatting rights on the woodlot that he owned was to get Thoreau to plant some trees. So he went to... Th the first thing he did was he went to Walden to plant some trees, not commonly understood nowadays of people who go... The other thing about Walden and is that it was, I mean, today the pond has the highest concentration of urine of any pond in New England. That's a fact that we needed to know. No, but, but the important thing is that, that that's not what you, that's not, it doesn't mean what you think it means. It doesn't well, I don't mean know what I think it means. Well, that it suddenly it de be become degraded by the modern world. It was almost, all, ever since the railway came, uh, Walden Pond was a resort. It's still a resort. It's a popular swimming hole. It has a path around it. It's very beautiful, but it's it's widely used by the populace, by Bostoners, Bostonians, by people from Cambridge and so on. Right, so we've got to get on with this. Um, uh, Kathy, uh, what sort of life did he lead briskly at, at Walden? Um, we've we've heard we've heard <coughs> mothers doing the washing. You know, it's as if he just popped down there and popped back again. But there was a sense he had a sense of wilderness. He had a sense of presence of being there. He talks about staying there nights, snow. Drum, 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 drum. So just give us briskly an idea of what was going on in those two years. What he did a lot was to walk. He, uh, in fact, he often didn't want people with him. He looked at things very closely. He'd sit and watch until birds came out. He'd look at every flower as it went. He kept a journal in which he daily would put down what he saw, and he said that he, if he, he could tell what day of the year it was by whether a certain flower bloomed. So essentially, he spent his time looking at nature. And he became an expert. in a, he, he became a serious observer of nature. Indeed. He, pu he published odd botanical books and so forth. Mm. He, was, he was an expert in that sense. He wasn't just an amateur. And there is... Sorry, you want to come in? Well, uh, can I just add that um, it's also the case that um, for uh, Thoreau, his time at Walden was a very serious uh, personal spiritual inquiry as well. And this is something which is very important for Walden in his book. So while uh, it's certainly true that Thoreau was uh, honing his skills as a naturalist, as an observer of nature, uh, and uh, skills which would come to fruition in later works, succession of forest trees and other yeah. serious scientific works that he would publish, um, really the main thrust of Walden is as a personal spiritual autobiography. Yeah. But that does tie in with the idea of nature with a capital N, Indeed, that, yeah. that nature is immutable truth. Yes. And you find immutable truth by concentrating on it. So I don't think he went out to be able to tell that a certain flower had a leaf. He went out because the, the truth of that flower, which no man could really influence, conveyed itself to him. Yeah. Now, there's been a lot of talk about him going back to Concord and his mother doing his washing and, and having a meal there a few times <coughs> and so forth. But he did achieve a sense of, and he certainly transferred it in Walden, a sense of being independent. That's one of the great powers of the book, as I think you say yourself in your writing, uh, um, Stephen. So there, we, we've got to hold on to that. We can sort of fritter it away if we're not careful. He did feel he was independent. He did feel he was cut off. The book certainly compresses the two years into one year and gives that impression, an impression which becomes a fact, not only a myth. Uh, so it, is there something... I mean, do you agree with that? I do. Thanks. OK. The railroad came uh, to Concord, Tim Morris, in 1844, as, as Stephen um, pointed out, 
Yeah, um, yes. Boston was only, uh, it was used to be four hours, it was just an hour. His view expressed was that if you wanted to go 30 miles across to Boston, the best thing was to walk, mm. because you, by the time you'd saved up the money and spent the time getting the fare, <laughs> it would be a waste of your time, a waste of your effort. It's easier just to walk. That's right. Um, yes. Now, of course... 30 miles is one thing, 300 another, but he was very opposed to the railroad he and was. then to the telegraph. Can you give us some background to that? Indeed. Well, I, I think um, the railroad for Thoreau became uh, a notable example of many uh, aspects of modernity which he deplored. Um, he calls it uh, atropos at one point, that is, that it's uh, sort of uh, fateful. Uh, Atropos, of course, being the last of the fates. He suggests that the, uh, the locomotive engine should be named this. Um, and what he really deplores about it, I think, is that, uh, firstly, that it changes the character of Concord. I mean, really, Concord becomes a suburb where it had become... Uh, it was previously sort of a market town, that it changes the character of Concord, but also particularly that it changes the character of the inhabitants of the area, too. Uh, that... Uh, a particular bugbear of the rose is bustle and speed, uh, and he particularly uh, likes slowness and simplicity. That's part of it. Uh, but also, simplicity, simplicity, simplicity. Of course, this is the phrase from Walden. Of course, mm. the, the simplification of one's life is uh, an, a hugely important prerequisite to any uh, subsequent philosophical thinking. Uh, so, speed is part of it, but also that he uh, sees this changing the character of his uh, of his area and the, particularly the people of that area. Um, and in fact, Concord does suffer a decline because mm. Boston begins to suck of the remaining course. strength out of it, as happens but all over the place. Particularly, for, uh, for example, in the previous uh, conveyance industries, uh, mm. you know, uh, horse and carriages, you know, the way uh, of getting goods to market. Uh, just, just to point, they, they, this is absolutely true and accurate and, and needs to be said. Uh, and it's very hard for Americans sometimes to understand that, that Concord had become provincial because we always think of it, as Cathy described it, as the, our great sort of sacred spot where the revolution began. But don't forget the other side of it is that intellectuals from Boston and Cambridge could come out on the train and go back the same night. Mm -hmm. So that the the lectures at the Lyceum and uh, the, the the meetings that the transcendentalists and others had didn't decline, but indeed increased after the railway came. So they, we mustn't forget that. It became the centre where they published the Dial, the magazine, the Dial, which exactly. Smith Thoreau exactly. edited for our His first editor was a woman, yes. Smith, Margaret Fuller, yeah, which we exactly. see. Yeah. And so you did have an intellectual community there. I think it was strongly. strengthened by the railways. Yeah. Strangely enough, you know, probably was, yeah. But I think the other point, Railway introduced something that we've since learned to call, I suppose, glo globalization, except it was on a very local level. That is to say that um, specialisms and, you know, markets shifted and, and, and there was no longer... After all, Concord had been a county sessions town, it, it, a town where they had the county sessions, county court, and that disappeared. It became less important in that respect. But it wasn't just the railway. He didn't like the telegraph. He said, no. we can now, Maine can now talk to Texas. Yeah. What is Maine? have to say that to Texas. That's it, maybe. nothing important to communicate. <laughs> I also like the one about the transatlantic cable. He said perhaps the first news that will leak through to the broad, flapping American ear is that Princess Adelaide has the whooping cough, <laughs> whoever Princess Adelaide was. But, you know. So he was a guinea. If it was new, he was a guinea. Yeah, he, especially the, he was against the general idea, that, that which is a very American idea, and which I frankly believe myself, that the, that the new things are always better than the old, that we're always making some kind of progress. Even in the depths of depression, there's always, you know, we always have Obama to hope for, or we always have something to look forward to. He hated that idea. He thought it was fatuous. But to, to take it seriously, because it seems how foolish to be against the railroad, how foolish to be against the telegraph, what a foolish person. But he was after something, wasn't he, Jim Morris? He was really onto something very serious about uh, in his opposition. He yes. wasn't just saying, Abba. He no. was saying, it, it wasn't just a negative, was it? He was putting forward a positive idea of life. Yes, I think so. That his um, again, it's uh, uh, what is the basis of? I, mean, I won't say the good life exactly. It's not quite that. But um, from what basis can one uh, uh, realistically and properly philosophize and uh, uh, go inward, improve the self? Um, and these things were for the railroad, the telegraph, etc. That we're talking about are for the road, very serious distractions to that business, that uh, hugely important business. Well, the quotation I read at the beginning of the program: "I want to live life deliberately." It's yeah. a bit like Socrates: "The unexamined life is not worth living." And he, they were onto that. Cathy Burke. Yes. Um, what do you want to say? In the, I mean, the point is, is that uh, he tried to bring it all together. He. 
I do think that he, although he was against the railway and so forth, he had a sneaking uh, admiration for entrepreneurs and inventors. And therefore, although he didn't like the outcome of the railway and what it did to Concord and what it did to people, he couldn't help admiring the inventiveness. And so therefore, the railway was had a, had a slight tinge of, of goodness about it. I mean, the, the invention itself was good. The outcome was bad. He was very interesting in the way he could look at things in a different, it, it, it put a difference to it, wasn't it? The, yes. the railway he talked about, but he also talked about the construction of the railway. Every sleeper, yes. The, yes. the actual sleeper, he said, that's a dead body of an yeah. Irishman or a Yankee. Yeah. Which, uh, every single piece of wood there. He, he, the other thing, that you, uh, and following that train of thought, it, um, the um, experts and scientists, scientists, I guess you'd say, in Massachusetts have been for years trying to work out how to improve agriculture in, in, in the state. Um, the, the old method, the, of the way that, that Englishmen settled America, New England especially, was, to, was the slash and burn method. They'd cut down trees, they'd burn them, they'd use the potash for the first crop or two as, as, um, as um, fertilizer, and then the land would give out and they'd move west. You know, Matthew Arnold comments on this, and lots of people do. And so the, the, the agricultural experts worked very hard to come up with you know, fertilizers, um, uh, plowing the field and making sure that you get it properly cultivated um, animals you know concentrated in small amount in small spaces and so on and Thoreau, Thoreau hated this you know he thought if you plow a field before you, you you sow it all the wildflowers disappear and you know if, if and the animals are kept in a kind of muck and and uh, terrible sort of uh, confusion and the farm farmers and the family and the animals are all mixed up together and then he planted so he decided to plant a field of beans and this is very funny actually because it's a it's directly runs directly counter to the commercialization of agriculture as he saw it um, that uh, he, he planted a crop not suitable for the soil he planted too late in the season he didn't prepare the ground he didn't mind sharing it with his chipmunks, and as a result, he harvested seven or eight bushels of beans per acre, as against the 20 or so bushels that the professionals were managing. But he was quite happy with that, and this was his sort of statement. And that's interesting, because it's not just a verbal argument. It is a physical enactment of what he believed. Kathy Burke. Well, it's just... <clears throat> Excuse me. I mean, bringing together Concord. He was very proud of being in Concord. He he was ineluctably tied to Concord, but he was also aware that it was declining. It was declining in population, for example. It was declining in importance. And what he was trying to do was to say, in a sense, Concord is important because this is the sort of place where I'm showing you that you can live the good life, you don't need the distractions, and therefore that even though it might in worldly terms be declining, this is really the center of the world spiritually and intellectually. Tim Morris, we're going to move on, but we've, we've rather f f flit past, we flitted quite swiftly past the romantic influence with the capital R. Um, Goethe, so more, more known here would be Coleridge and, and Wordsworth. These, yeah. I, the ideas that they had about nature, about it's a Look on nature, and you will be taught about treating nature properly, about cultivating your own garden. So, mm -hmm. these were with him all the time. Weren't they? He was a massive reader. We haven't brought that in, in classics, yes. like. but he was. This was part of his thinking as well as his reading. Yes, indeed. So, I mean, uh, there's a chapter, of course, in Walden on his reading, uh, where he sort of outlines, uh, you know, what exactly. Uh, he has been reading on what ought to be read, even perhaps maybe more importantly. Now, the Romantics uh, are. Uh, this is again through Emerson, I think, basically, because of course Emerson had met them. So uh, Thoreau could Emerson's have tour of Europe, yeah. in his tour of Europe yeah. in the th thirty-two, thirty-three, uh, and uh, perhaps even more importantly, Carlyle. Actually, um, mm. now of course there are the British Romanticist views of the landscape. Um, we need to be a bit careful though, because the landscape is not uh, always first and foremost ideal for Emerson. Uh, f f excuse me for throw that is that he tends to extrapolate those idealisms out of minute observation in ways which perhaps Coleridge and Wordsworth would not have done Can uh, you just give us an instance of that? Well, uh, for example let's go back to the railroad again um, while this uh, incredible uh, technology and development is happening uh, the really the central part of the description of the railroad for Thoreau is to go down to the sandbank upon which it is built and look at the thaw and look at the rivulets uh, of you know, water coming off this. Right? So he's uh, an observer in this way. 
which is not primarily and first and foremost an observer of landscape, at least not in the first instance. It's of specifics first and foremost. Mm -hmm. Um, whereas I think the British Romantics would have been working perhaps uh, with landscape uh, in a larger sense. So, Kathy yeah. Burke, he, he was fascinated by the Native American Indians. What did he find there? Do you think he idealized them? Well, it uh, seems to me that what he found was the sort of life he thought was worth living. He saw the Indians um, as tied to nature. I mean, he... he Concord is full of Indian artifacts. A lot of tribes have lived, have lived there, um, and you could look down on the ground. He's walking with with a friend, and, and the friend says, are there arrowheads around here? And he looks down, and there's one right in front of him. And he said, yes, here it is. And he saw the Indians as the only people left as a people who were actually so tied to nature. They tied to the seasons. They're tied to what the, the food around them, and they their whole response, he says, he thinks, is not tied to civilization as we know it. It's tied to their own natures and their surroundings. Tim Morris, he writes Walden. It's published in 1854. How is it received then? Um, much better than his first book, that's for sure, which was uh, mm. rather disastrous for Thoreau. Uh, there are about, uh, I think, just over 90 contemporary reviews of Walden which have been collected and uh, and examined, and in general they're uh, quite positive. They tend to emphasise uh, its novelty, the fact that there are the sturdy common sense to be had within Walden, uh, but also uh, the negative aspects of this would be that uh, this is just more of the transcendentalist disease, as Edgar Allan Poe called it. You know, uh, We have to remember that the transcendentalist movement, although intellectually powerful, was not um, without its uh, very serious critics uh, within the states as a whole. And so, um, you know, there are, there are equivocations about it, but quite positively, there's one particularly interesting reviewer called Charles uh, Frederick Briggs, I think his name was, who calls uh, Thoreau a Yankee Diogenes, which is uh, an interesting comparison. Diogenes, of course, being the cynic poet from uh, Greece, uh, 412 BC or so, uh, who lived in Athens, uh, at least allegedly, in a tub, swore on poverty uh, as the greatest virtue, uh, and Thoreau is uh, considered by these very urban New York critics to be uh, you know, usefully uh, c compared to this. Almost, uh, Burke, almost diametrically opposite to the life at Walden, or you may, you may find a way to bring them together, is his... Um, interest in slavery, not only interest, his activism in slavery. There were these... Can you just tell us how, how active he was in his position as a conductor on the Underground Railway? He's very active. There are two fugitive slave acts, uh, one of which, in fact, was, uh, was uh, promulgated in 1793 and the second much worse one in, in 1850. And more or less what they had in common was that if a slave escaped, um, it was the owner's right to take him back. And what these two slave acts did, and especially the, se the second one, was involve every person in the country, every state, every locality in the responsibility to actually um, send these back. Now, the way that you could, the only way really you could be sure of being free was getting to Canada. But if you went, if a slave, uh, an escaping slave, or even a free black in some cases, uh, was out in the street, he was liable to actually be grabbed off the street. So there developed what was called the Underground Railway, which was essentially a series of safe houses. They'd travel at night from safe house to safe house, and the, what the conductor did was actually to get them from safe house to safe house. But Th Thoreau went further than that. His own family home was also used as a safe house. He was adamantly anti-slavery. I mean, philosophically you would be, because that's a man who's not free. But spiritually, and, and just as a good man, the idea of slavery was just so appalling to him that he actually emerged from Walden, one might say, and was actively involved, involved as you say, in, in the um, agitation and actual involvement against it. Stephen Fender, can you tell us a bit, can we develop this a bit more? Um, he refused to pay his poll tax at one stage because he wanted to make a stand against the Mexican-American War again to do with slavery yeah. and he was put in jail so he was pushing it very far there. He was. I mean, he, he went uh, to jail 
for not paying his poll tax. That's his federal tax. He was perfectly willing to pay local taxes to upkeep of roads and schools and so on, but he didn't want to support a government which also supported slavery. And he went to jail. Somebody, as he then rather ungenerously said, somebody interfered and paid the tax. So in fact, he was out the next morning. He only spent one night in jail. But he made the point, and he then wrote an essay called a resistance to civil government, which later was retitled um, on civil disobedience. An important title because it uh, plays on um, the English philosopher, the moral philosopher William Paley's essay on the duty of civil obedience. Paley argued, in effect, that if, if, if a resistance to civil government was going to cause an uproar, then it was better just to obey. In other words, no revolution. But Thoreau's line was very different. And the basic premise of this essay was that um, the um, consent of in government must be grounded on the individual conscience of the citizen. And this is quite important because it doesn't derive from Massachusetts polity at all, but from the polity of the um, of a man banished from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and the founder of Rhode Island, uh, Roger Williams, who said, I commend that man, whether Jew or Turk or Papist or whoever, steers no other no otherwise than his conscience does and introduced the first um, community in America, therefore, in which um, religious test was, n- was no barrier um, against, uh, against full uh, participation in the government. Tim, so uh, he, we're talking still on the subject of, of slavery, Tim Morris. He supported John Brown. Now, in a way, John Brown, whose soul goes marching on, um, that, one, that John Brown, yeah. uh, stood for things that Walden disapproved of. So can you tell us what that meant for Sorry, that Thoreau disapproved of. So can you tell us where he was there? Uh, well, yes, I mean, the, the Thoreau of Walden may be uh, seen to be uh, simple, uh, a pacifist. Uh, he's even advocating within Walden uh, all sorts of, um, uh, if like, withdrawal, you know, from social life, from social activity. Uh, and John Brown, of course, is entirely the opposite, because Brown is really the most radical uh, the uh, tip of the spear, if you like, of the abolitionist movement, uh, and is willing, of course, to turn this uh, to violence and to arms slaves. Um, he leads. He leads attacks on arms depots to get weapons for indeed, the slaves. Yeah, John um, Brown. Does, d- Brown's career really starts in bloody Kansas after mm. the Nebraska Kansas Act, um, 1854. Uh, and of course, Thoreau meets John Brown in, I think, 1858 in Boston with Emerson. Uh, when Brown is trying to collect funds for precisely that later attack on Harper's Ferry, which is an attack really to seize arms uh, and then head south, uh, arming slaves as he went and uh, to produce a sort of rolling insurrection. This was Brown's idea. People are killed, Brown's arrested, there's yeah. uproar, but at that, at that time, Thoreau comes out and defends him, yeah, even though Brown has been anything but a fascist pacifist and in that sense contradicts some of Thoreau's ideas so that's quite an interesting contradiction. There were stages of this though I mean uh, Thoreau doesn't just go from the civil disobedience essay which is inspired by Mexican-American war and his uh, distaste for funding it Uh, there's a sort of intermediate stage really uh, which is his uh, paper uh, Slavery in Massachusetts so there's uh, throughout the 1850s um, you could say that Thoreau becomes increasingly radicalized uh, uh, about this. But yes, he stands up and uh, supports Brown, as, uh, which is a really quite an unusual thing to do. Uh, the, if you like, the majority view of John Brown's actions at Harper's Ferry uh, is that uh, he's crazy to do this. Uh, and most abolitionists uh, sort of retreat from Brown's actions. Yes, I think that this is a, an interesting case because I mean, something else he says in Civil Disobedience is it's no good being progressive, it's no good opposing the Mexican War in theory or being against slavery if you aren't willing to do something that makes you uncomfortable about it. I mean, he said that the opponents to a return in Massa- to the opponents to reform in Massachusetts are not a hundred thousand politicians in the South, but a hundred thousand merchants and farmers here who are more interested in commerce and agriculture than they are in human. Humanity. He felt that, you know, you had to... I mean, this may be part of the contradiction you're talking about, that it's all very well being a pacifist, but if you have to go to war to defend your conscience or your conscientious sense of the right, then so be it. Does this link up, Kathy Berth, with, with Emerson describing Thoreau in his eulogy as he, someone who found himself not only unrepresented in actual politics but almost equally opposed to every class of reformer? Mm. Interesting, 
Yes, I think. Um, the difficulty is that there were reformers. There were those who paid their dues to abolitionist societies, but as Stephen has emphasized, um, wouldn't actually want to do anything. Thoreau, it's it's interesting because although we see him as a man who was, a, who was individual but focused on the locality, the specific, he's actually as famous now, one might say, because of his activity because his engagement with the great public events of his time, that there comes a time when you have to leave the pond and you have to go out and put your body where, where it, it, it belongs, that you can't, be, you can't be neutral towards slavery, you can't be neutral toward a war which is nothing but a cynical land grab. And also the whole eco, e- ecological business has worked, as it were, if one wants to use this term, in his favour because of, of what he did uh, out in the uh, in Walden Ponds. And the book, book Walden, which started in a fairly undistinguished way in terms of sales and reviews, Indeed. 200 English editions translated all over mm-hmm. the world and, and, and so on. He died when he was 45 of TB. Mm-hmm. Briskly, wh- what do you think his influence is, is now, Tim? Um, partly that uh, Thoreau is eminently teachable, so he sort of remains uh, in the academy, I think, in quite a, uh, a direct way. But also, um, in a larger sense, that really uh, there are uh, there's a throw for everybody, you might say. There's the ecologist throw, uh, there's the uh, proto environmentalist, protectionist of nature. Uh, but also, for some people, Thoreau is read uh, really as an anarchist, too, in his sort of political writings. So uh, this um, wide variety of approach, I think, uh, has uh, increased his reputation uh, over the years since. And that would include, you would have to include in that his enormous impact on Gandhi, his enormous impact on the Reverend Martin Luther King, Jr., who put his, uh, who read him, who, and put his principles, especially in um, civil disobedience... And in, up, to the pro- Vietna- up to the Vietnam... And the Vietnam protests, so. exactly. Catholic Park. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, yes, Which Kathy knows about, <laughs> first hand. <laughs> uh, indeed. Um, what we have forgotten about Thoreau, and one reason he actually continues his impact, is his writing, that he took nature and put it in beautiful prose that is a pleasure to read now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kathy Burke, Tim Morris, and Stephen Fender. Next week we'll be discussing the history of the writing of history, how Western history has been written through the ages. Thanks for listening. We hope you've enjoyed this Radio 4 podcast. You can find hundreds of other programmes about history, science and philosophy at bbc.co.uk forward slash Radio 4.